Hello and welcome to the Simple Med Radiology Lecture Series. My name is Dr. Marcus Judge and I am the Radiology Lead. Today will be a lecture on the basics of chest x-rays. This lecture is aimed at preclinical or phase one medical students and allied health professionals and so it is pitched at that level. Our learning objectives for this lecture include understanding the indications for chest x-rays, one of the most commonly ordered types of scans. You will also be able to visualize how this test will be carried out on the patient and how the image generated is created, which will facilitate you to being able to interpret the anatomy shown. You will also be aware of the three most common types of chest x-ray views and what they look like. There are a wide range of indications for a chest x-ray. However, it is always important to consider whether a scan is necessary, particularly an ionizing scan, like an x-ray. An x-ray delivers the same amount of ionizing radiation as 10 days of background radiation, which may not seem hugely impactful in isolation, but it is not uncommon to see a significant proportion of patients who present to A&E receive a chest x-ray without any clear clinical indication. Remember that ionizing radiation can cause DNA damage and lead to cancer, and so as clinicians, we can actually cause harm to our patients by ordering unnecessary scans. Some common indications for a chest x-ray include a patient presenting with respiratory symptoms, such as shortness of breath, coughing, and hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood. Unexplained weight loss can also be an indication with a relevant background such as being a smoker. Unexplained weight loss is defined as a reduction in the patient's weight of at least 5% of the patient's usual body weight within the preceding six months. That is not the expected consequence of the treatment of a known illness or diet, and is the most common universal red flag for cancer. It's worth noting that it is not possible to diagnose or exclude cancer from a chest x-ray. However, you may be able to see anomalies or acute changes as a result of the cancer, such as a pleural effusion or lung shadowing. A strange but potentially useful indication for a chest x-ray is a that of an erect chest x-ray for abdominal peritonism to assess for free air under the diaphragm, which can be indicative of a bowel perforation. As part of a clinical examination, chest-related signs, particularly when accompanied by a drop in vital signs, can be assessed using a chest x-ray. For example, focal crackles heard on auscultation of the chest could be assessed for a pneumonia, or a reduction in air entry at the lung bases could be assessed for a lung collapse or pleural effusion. Finally, lines and procedures often require chest x-ray, for position checks, and to check that the procedure has not caused a lung puncture known as a pneumothorax, whereby air enters the pleural cavity. One important procedure which needs assessment via chest x-ray is the insertion of a nasogastric or NG feeding tube to identify its position and check that it is in the stomach rather than the lungs before passing feed through it. It is a never event to feed a patient through their NG tube into their lung as this can cause severe aspiration pneumonia and lead to sepsis, respiratory failure and death. So, how is the chest x-ray actually carried out? Put simply, a patient is placed between an x-ray source and a detection screen. Most commonly, the patient is standing with their back towards the x-ray source, with their hands on their hips. When in this configuration, with the source behind the patient, the x-ray view is called a PA view, or postero anterior view. The high energy electromagnetic rays from the x-ray source travel towards and through the patient. These are absorbed in differing levels based on the properties of the tissues hit, meaning differing amounts of x-rays reach the detector based on what they've had to travel through. This difference in the quantity of radiation hitting the receiver is what is used to create the final x-ray image. There are a number of factors that determine the level of absorption of x-rays and the appearance of those x-rays on the detection film. One, and possibly the most important, is the radiological density of the tissue. This is determined by both the density 
and the atomic number, which is the number of protons in an atom's nucleus, of the material being imaged. For example, bones are made up of a large amount of calcium, which has a high atomic number and so will appear more white on the film. Through this, we can deduce that the higher the level of absorption of x-rays, the whiter the appearance on the film, since bones appear lighter on the film. Therefore, when x-rays pass through just air, the film will appear black, as there is very limited absorption of the x-rays by air due to its low density. A material which absorbs a lot of x-rays and so appears whiter on the x-ray film is referred to as radioopaque. Other factors that affect the appearance on the x-ray include the physical thickness of the structures passed through, as well as the duration of exposure to the x-ray source, a variable which can be modified by the radiographer while taking the x-ray and can determine the overall quality of the output. Too much or too little exposure can lead to an unreadable x-ray, and so it is important to assess whether the exposure of a film is adequate before trying to interpret an x-ray. Here is a diagrammatic representation of how the density of a material can change its appearance on an X-ray film. Metallic components such as dynamic hip screws or artifacts from metallic jewellery will appear very clear white. You will often find bone being white grey colour. Note that the density of the bone is important. People with osteoporosis will have a lower bone density and so their bones would appear darker on an X-ray. Air being solidly black is helpful. If a patient has a collapsed lung or pneumothorax, the lack of lung markings in an area and absolute black colour can indicate pure air in an empty space, which is pathological. Before being able to identify pathology on a chest x-ray, it is important to become comfortable with what a normal chest x-ray looks like, including the anatomical landmarks to look out for. On the screen is a normal, Postero anterior chest x-ray. The landmarks highlighted are just to help you orientate yourself on the image. We will talk about a systematic approach to understanding a chest x-ray shortly. They are also a good example of the different types of densities of tissues and how they appear on a chest x-ray. The clavicle, made of bone, appears mostly white. The heart, made of tissue, is quite thick and so despite the tissue being less radiologically dense, it also appears quite grey-white. The lung area, which is mostly filled with air, appears darker. Note the presence of white streaks across the lungs. These are lung markings from the lung tissue and are entirely normal. At this point, it is important to highlight that a chest x-ray is flipped when viewed. The patient's right will be on the left of the chest x-ray as you view it. This is why the patient's heart can be seen on the right of the image, despite being on the left-hand side of the body. You will become used to this as you see more x-rays, but it's worth being aware of when learning the initial anatomy and when describing your findings. There are three common types of chest x-ray views. PA views are the most commonly done. I like to remember this with the saying, P is popular. AP views are often done when a patient is unable to sit up properly or mobilise. This is often due to being very ill or attached to machines, and so these scans are often done using portable x-rays, with the x-ray machine in front of the patient and an x-ray screen slid behind the patient's back in bed. Lateral views are often taken with PA views and can provide an element of depth to a scan aiding in interpretation. It is worth noting that an AP view cannot be used to interpret the size of the heart. Objects nearer to the X-ray tube appear artificially enlarged due to divergence of the X-ray beam, resulting in the heart appearing artificially large on AP radiographs. A PA radiograph should be used to measure the cardiothoracic ratio. In order to interpret a chest x-ray, a systematic approach can be very helpful. This avoids missing things by only looking for certain diagnoses and helps with finder's bias, a phenomenon whereby the radiologist finds something pathological and then stops looking for further abnormalities. After assessing technical quality, 
which we will cover in another lecture, an A to F approach can be used to check all aspects of the scans for anomalies. As part of A, your airway assessment, it is important to view the upper conducting airways. This includes looking at the windpipe, known as the trachea, and assessing its position, which can be off-center if there is a lung collapse or a tension pneumothorax, whereby there is a pressure buildup on one side of the chest cavity, pushing the trachea across. We've added the path of the right and left main bronchi and the trachea coming down to help you better visualize what you are seeing. You will notice that the left main bronchus takes off slightly more horizontally when compared to the right. This is normal physiology and explains why a patient is more likely to get aspiration of fluids and food into their right lung, making aspiration pneumonia more common on the right. As part of B, we assess the bony anatomy, looking in particular for fractures or abnormalities. It is very difficult to assess for rib fractures on a chest x-ray it is also very common to miss them by not attempting to look, and fractures can cause punctures of the lungs and explain other clinical findings. We've labelled the key bones here. The clavicles are fairly clear to see, but it can be difficult to fully understand how the ribs sit. Since this is a PA film, we are seeing the ribs from behind, curving round and forwards towards the sternum at the front. The vertebral bodies of the spine cannot be assessed very clearly on a chest x-ray, but can be used as a good marker of technical adequacy and film exposure. They should be visible and distinguishable on your film. As part of C, we assess the cardiac silhouette. Knowing the normal anatomy of the cardiac silhouette is helpful, as sections such as the aortic knuckle can often be very pronounced and can be misinterpreted as a pathological mass. To visualize the heart better, here's a little cartoon. You can see that the heart is slightly angled and the left ventricle, which pumps blood around the entire body, is slightly more pronounced due to increased muscular mass. And these can be seen clearly on a chest x-ray. The cardiothoracic ratio can be used to identify an enlargement of the heart borders, which is most commonly from cardiomegaly, but can be due to other processes such as pericardial effusion. The cardiothoracic ratio must be measured on a PA chest x-ray, and it is the ratio of the maximal horizontal cardiac diameter to maximal horizontal thoracic diameter. A normal measurement for this ratio is 0.42 to 0.5. D and E represent the diaphragm and pleura, with E referencing pleural effusions, which are buildups of fluid in the pleura. The diaphragm is the muscle which helps create negative pressure in the lungs and makes us breathe. It can be visualized on a chest x-ray at the bottom of the lungs, with the right hemidiaphragm being slightly raised compared to the left due to the presence of the liver under the right. Abnormally elevated hemidiaphragms can be signs of lung collapse as the diaphragm is pulled up by the collapsed lung. The pleura are the sacs that surround the lungs. They should be flush with the lungs, with no air visible between the area of the lung and the pleura. If there is any air visible, this would indicate air in the thorax, known as a pneumothorax. The right and left costophrenic angles are important to note. These should be sharp and pronounced, plus clearly visible. They are the area where any pleural fluid would most commonly build up, so if they are blunted, this would represent a buildup in this area known as a pleural effusion. Finally, the gastric bubble can also be visualized on a chest x-ray, though not always. What can be seen is actually the buildup of air within the stomach, and so the size of the gastric bubble can vary widely. The gastric bubble is particularly important when assessing the position of a nasogastric tube after insertion. The end of the NG should be within the confines of the stomach. F represents the lung fields. It may seem strange to assess the actual lung so late on, but this avoids skipping ahead and missing any key precipitating factors in any pathology you find. The lungs are generally quite a dark colour 
due to their high air content, with streaks of grey indicating the lung markings. Focusing on the right lung, it can be useful to create a 3D image of what you're seeing using the natural view. The right upper lobe looks as present. However, the right lower lobe actually overlaps the upper lobe. Looking at the lateral view can help explain what you are seeing. Due to this, the lungs are often split into zones to help with description as the lateral view is not always available. For the purposes of description, the lungs are divided into zones, upper, middle and lower. Each of these zones occupies approximately one third of the height of the lungs. The lung zones do not equate to the lung lobes. For example, the lower zone on the right compromises the middle and lower lobes. In conclusion, chest x-rays have a wide variety of indications and low radiation burden as far as ionizing scans go. They can be good screening scans prior to carrying out more ionizing scans and be used in acute situations for initial assessment. It is vital to use a systematic approach to assess the chest x-ray in order to avoid missing crucial findings and to avoid finder's bias. Always check the view of the chest x-ray you are interpreting. Most commonly, this will be a PA view. However, AP views may be done in patients who are unable to mobilize or are critically ill. Finally, knowledge of the anatomy you are seeing on the chest x-ray is important before attempting to find any pathology. In our next lecture, we will cover x-ray interpretation, some common findings, and what these may look like. That is the end of this lecture. Be sure to check out simplemed.co.uk for hundreds of free articles, thousands of free questions, and any support with questions you might need. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.